you go. The higher ups, I don't want to make them upset. Um, so this is biome. Um, we're a interdisciplinary biology, mechanical engineering, whatever, a maker space and environment on campus. I still don't know what the O stands for though. Um, so if anyone can take guesses, maybe it's like an owl or something. And this is our webinar series. We do these weekly. Um, we switch off between me and Alan. Alan is amazing. He's one of the lab managers. And I'm also one of the lab managers, but I don't have quite the swagger that Alan brings to the table. Open, it means open. So that's crazy. Um, and yeah, and so this week we're gonna do uh, protein folding and predicting them. Maybe you guys showed up two weeks ago. Maybe you didn't because it was like a super weird time because I was struggling with uh, sickness and things like that. And I also struggled in that, uh, and that webinar it didn't work. And so we're returning to it a little more professional this time, a little more on point, uh, and it should be good. So I asked at the beginning, a couple of people were in here. If anyone knows Kenny Rogers, he sang this song. Uh, that's the only song I know by him, so I'm not gonna claim that I'm a fan. It's like, a, if you're a real fan of the band, name five songs or something like that. I can only name one. And this is a Biome production. Um, Coolio. All right, let me get started. I need to like, set up my thing correct. Okay, cool, now we're ready. <laughs> All right, yeah, any questions, uh, feel free to unmute yourself and ask. Um, I promise I won't yell at you, maybe a little bit, and, uh, or just ask in the chat, it should be great. Awesome, so I'm gonna start off by asking y'all some questions in a second. So we're going over protein structures. So there's four types of protein structures. You have primary, secondary, tertiary, and quaternary structures. And I'm always gonna mess up this one, just saying it because I can't speak correctly. Um, and uh, they're all really cool and they're all super special and each is unique in its own way. And they all are very important to the function of your entire body because proteins kind of make up everything. Um, and so it's important to know them. And it's also important to know how they react and how we can predict how they fold. Because proteins aren't just one straight line. So let's start talking about them. So my first question for y'all is how do primary structures form? Or if you're even, what is a primary structure? So first, like what is a primary structure and then how do they form? And anyone's free to answer this. Yeah, the order of amino acids. Good, yeah, yeah. Good, yeah. And so that's a great example of like what a primary structure is. It's just a bunch of amino acids. You may hear me say residues, they're the same thing. Um, and, they're, and it's just that in a line. So imagine you pulled out like a protein out of your body, you strained it out, that's your primary structure. Um, it's unfolded, it's just in a line. Um, and so how do they form? How do, they, how do I, have, I have leucine in one hand and uracil in another, how do I mash them together to make a, a primary structure? They form peptide bonds, yeah, perfect, awesome. They do form peptide bonds. And so great, so let's talk about peptide bonds. And peptide, you'll hear that also referred is kind of like a protein. Um, great. And so here, we got, a, we got a protein here. And a protein has four kind of fundamental parts. You're always going to have your alpha carbon. Hence here. This is a really low quality picture, but that's okay. Um, you got your amine group. You got your carboxylic acid. You got your R group. And this is what defines the protein, or defines the amino acid, I should say, is the R group, right? A leucine and uracil are going to have these three parts, your hydrogen, your amine, and your carboxylic acid but the R group is what's different. Um, and so two of them will come together. Sorry, one second. Yeah, two of them will come together. Holy moly. Um, and they'll do a dehydration bond. So what is a dehydration bond? Does anyone know what a dehydration bond is? Yeah, exactly. You take a water out of here. So you take an oxygen from the carboxylic acid and you take two hydrogens from the amine group. And you can see that right here. And so proteins, they're also defined by their N terminus and their C terminus. And so what you're going to get is, uh, you know, this kind of formation here and you're gonna have primary structure. And so we can come back here. Oh, whoops, there we go. And you can see, right? You have your N terminus here and it goes all the way down to the C terminus. And this is your kind of primary structure of a protein. Give me one second real quick guys 
figure one thing out with my Wi-Fi. All right, I had to unplug my, like make sure my router was everything good like that. So thank you guys, cool. Um, cool, all righty. And so that's primary structure, it's pretty simple, right? It's just, you know, straight line. Um, and so in your simplest formation of proteins, you're gonna probably write the primary structure. So I won't belabor the point too much. Now, secondary structure, secondary structures are where they get interesting. So sec secondary structures are alpha helixes and beta sheets, so your pleated sheets is maybe sometimes what you hear them. And an alpha helix is what it sounds like, it's a helix. It's the bending and twisting of your primary structure to form this alpha helix. And then a, uh, uh, a pleated sheet, a beta sheet, kind of like they curve a little bit, but they kind of stay in this straight formation. And they kind of spread out like that, right? And so they're gonna get wider. And so they won't curve, but they'll just kind of, if you have like a, if you outstretch origami, it's kind of what it looks like, that those bends in the paper and stuff like that. And so my question for you all is how do these secondary structures form? If you got any guesses in the chat and stuff like that. Yeah, very good. Negative charge, uh, non-polar with non-polar. Yeah, very close, very close. So it has to do with polarity, um, but it has to do, let me go try to go back here. Oh, don't want to give it away. <laughs> Maybe you guys saw it. As it deal with a certain, uh, you know, part, it has to do with the residues, hydrogen bonds. You got it, yeah, there you go. It's hydrogen bonds. And so um, certain, so a hydrogen bond, what is that? A hydrogen bond is um, inherent polarity not inherent actually polarity, but force polarity based on certain parts of your uh, chemical. So let's say I had an oxygen with two hydrogens, right? Your H2O, right? That's going to have a polarity to it because the oxygen wants to pull the electron super strongly while the hydrogens are like, eh, I don't know what to do with this electron. And they let it get pulled from them. It's like uh, the bully and uh, the nerd, but nerds are cool. <laughs> right? Um, and so they pull them super strong and they bully them and get the electrons away. And so you create a polarity across that molecule, but it's not inherent, right? It's not like uh, you're missing electrons. Um, so you get hydrogen bonds, right? And so these hydrogen bonds will form in certain ways that will force an alpha helix or a beta pleated sheet. And you can kind of see a better example of what that looks like here, right? Ooh, it's like a slide. It's like shoots and ladders almost. So an important thing to notice is like, Whenever you're forming a protein, or if you've ever pulled up like pymo or something like that, you really you can see these sheets and things like that, but you can't. You can only see them when they're in their tertiary structure, and we'll talk about that in a second. So they form spon spontaneously. So they're intermediate. So these uh, alpha helixes and beta sheets will form with each other very quickly until the protein forms its tertiary structure and has a full 3D structure. Um, so they're just an intermediate between once it comes out of your uh, you know uh, you, uh, after translation. Um, into the tertiary structure, um, which is important, right, to understanding these the, the mechanics of how proteins fold and things like that. So great. Um, if I'm going too fast, just let me know also. <laughs> cool. All right, so tertiary structures. Now, it's getting a little more complicated as we go, and I think we can see that. So tertiary structures are the 3D. It's the, uh, the pleated sheets interacting with your uh, uh, alpha helixes and you got these hairpin turns and things like that. So it's getting really complex. You even have like maybe non amino acid chemicals intervolved in there and things like that. So how do tertiary structures form? Tertiary. Interaction between the backbone and the side chains. Close, yeah, disulfide bridge. Yeah, there are, so yeah, there's a lot of ways um, where tertiary structures, structures can actually form. Uh, one of them is also dis, disulfide bridges are one of them um, in which you can, um, you know, two, two uh, parts of the protein will come across together to make a really strong bond because sulfide bonds are really strong. Um, but there's another way too. Um, interaction between backbone and side chains. Yeah, that definitely happens. I, I want you guys to think about what, where would the protein be found? What solution would the protein be found in? Just naturally. Is 
Cytosol? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And what, what is cytosol mainly made out of? It's mainly water. Yeah, and Andrew just types hydrophobic uh, interactions. That's true, yeah. So exactly, so it's going to interact with water. So let's look at, I want to first look at the different residues. And don't worry, I have a bigger picture. Um, and so let's look at these different residues. Um, and let's, let's see, so right, you got you know, like arginine and histidine, and you can see they have like inherent electrical charge to them uh, off these R groups down here. You know, here's your central carbon and things like that. And you won't see the H group because those are implied um, if you've ever drawn these models before. Um, lysine is another one. You have uh, hydrophobic groups. Again, hydrophobic means water hating. They, they hate water so much they don't ever want to touch it ever again. You can see these are mainly just, you know, these carbon and hydrogen, maybe some sulfur. Um, but carbon and hydrogen chains, you know. Um, think about long, you know, fatty acids. What are fatty acids? You know, butter, which is made of oil. It's just these really long carbon chains with hydrogens. Um, there's nowhere for the hydrogen, like I said earlier, for it to kind of form that polarity and form those hydrogen bonds with. So it's never going to do it. You never really want to interact with it. Um, I mean, you also have special cases. And a lot of times these special cases are what you find in those uh, disulfide bonds. Um, they'll bond, bond together. I know cytosine is one where that happens quite often and it's pretty famous for it. So yeah, so you have all these sites. And so then what happens there? Uh, you may be asking like, hey, it's just, it's just your residues, it's just your amino acids, that's not enough. You're right. There's this thing called the hydrophobic effect. So the hydrophobic effect, let's look at this picture here, is when you see no two nonpolar molecules, you know, surrounded by water and they come together like that, as though it was water coming together. You can see this before all the time if you make uh, water and oil. You've seen this before. Or if you drop water on a leaf, the leaf will have a hydrophobic little uh, sheath over it, and that water will build up on it because it doesn't want to interact with that oil on top of the leaf. So it'll build up into that little ball. You see that all the time. Um, and it's, it's, it's the um, hydrophobic effect. And so this, I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about this and then why it's important to protein in just one second. But you may be looking at this and you'd be like, hey, this doesn't make sense entropy-wise. Um, entropy is like a unit of, good way to say, it's like a unit of chaos, a unit of disorder. And the natural law is things become less structured naturally than more structured. When you burn a fire, the interaction isn't perfect. When I rub my hands together, the interaction isn't perfect, and so that's why it gets a little heat, right? In your body, that's true. It's why your body can stay at the temperature it stays at. It's very cool. Um, and so you look at this and you goes, hey, wait a minute, this becomes more structured. Now, I, I, I'm just sharing this as a, like a side fact because I think it's cool and entropy is cool. But if you look, the water that surrounds it, there's more water surrounding it here in these two than here. And then the water that's now free and no longer surrounding the nonpolar molecule has more room to move. And so actually entropy, this is entropy driven. It actually creates more chaos by doing it this way than other ways. So it's just interesting to think about like that. And so that's a hydrophobic effect. And so now you can imagine you have your, a bunch of your baited uh, sheets or, or pleated structures, and these are other types of interactions. You can imagine them folding on each other where they wanna protect the uh, hydro, hydrophobic amino acids and keep them towards the center while allowing the hydrophilic or hi, uh, water-loving amino acids to be kind of towards the outside, and you find that all the time, all the time. That's kind of how they fold and they're forced to crumble like that um, electrostatically. So yeah, so you get hydrophobic interactions, you get hydrogen bonds forming here, you get disulfide bonds, and those are really strong proteins, those are strong bonds. Um, you have other ionic bonds too. And so there's a couple other ways too, you know, it's not, there's not one rule, because it's a very complicated science, but that is one way to, a good way to think about it. So yeah, very good. And now you have an overall 3D structure here. It kind of looks like a tapeworm, or if you watch SpongeBob, like the large Texas worm that eats the whole city. I may be dated, I don't know. <laughs> I used to watch SpongeBob all the time. Now we have, uh, in, I'm gonna butcher it, quaternary structures. Um, and so what are quaternary structures? Mm -hmm. Yeah, Andrew said it, good. So yeah, so you have different, yeah, multiple photoprotein. Yeah, y'all are getting it, yeah, woo. You guys are now forming a quaternary structures, but I'm being correct, because they're all coming together and being right. Yeah, and that's exactly what it is. You have like multiple proteins and they come together to form a huge complex. And by golly gee, they're very confusing and I don't quite understand everything about them right now. They get very complex. 
Um, and also you have like sites in them that are like, like hemoglobin is a good one where you have these iron sites in them. Iron's not any part of, you don't have iron in any of your residues, but it's an essential part to this because the continuous structure takes that iron. It's very confusing. But yeah, so hemoglobin is a great example and one you're probably familiar with. If you're not sure what that is, that's okay. It's the, it's the protein in your blood that binds to oxygen. And it's, um, it's also why your blood's red or you know, turns you know, red with oxygen because it's like rust. That's what it does. Um, so great, yeah, yeah. So yeah, it's multiple structures coming together. And so um, I'm not gonna really get into how they form and things like that because it's it too complicated and more complicated than what we're doing right now I wanna focus on. Because um, they can do like, the structures also do this thing where they like switch off on each other like that and have like conformational changes within. Really cool stuff, um, a lot more to learn about them if you guys want. Um, but now I wanna focus onto predicting structures. So as we saw, you know, going from primary to secondary to tertiary, you have an increase in complexity and also increase in amount of interactions. So how do you imagine some ways you guys would predict these? Give me some ways you guys think you'd go about predicting these if you're a scientist. Mm -hmm. Yeah, good, good. Yeah, you guys are getting great. Yeah. So look at types of bonds present between the groups, looking at characteristics of the name. Yeah, I mean, no, absolutely. yeah, good, good. Um, awesome. So yeah, so yeah. So do you think you'd go do this hand by hand? No, right? You wouldn't, right? <laughs> it, it doesn't make sense. You can have an um, example is Titan. Titan's the biggest protein in your body. It's like, can be up to like 34,000 amino acids long. It's in your muscles. It's huge. It helps form your muscle fibers if you have them, I don't know about me, but um, they're huge. And so, yeah, it's really cool. And so uh, um, it's impossible to go like a human brain to go hand by hand and figure this out, but we have computer programs for it. And they'll go down the line and figure out ways they can fold and how these interactions can take place. Some of them are a little smarter than others. The one we're working with, I think it, it does a good job. It's not the smartest thing you could think of. So maybe if you wanna go into bio computation, you could think of smarter ways to do it. Um, and with machine learning on the rise, this is definitely becoming a great possibility where you cannot only just predict structures that exist now based on known models, but you can start predicting future structures based on things that maybe have never existed before. Because we're always, we can make and engineer new proteins. It's really cool. So let's talk about some of those. So I'm gonna, so the one we'll be using today is Rosetta Commons, Rosetta Commons. And uh, I guess uh, it's the hub for modeling software is what they call themselves. It's really nice. It's free to use and I'll show you guys how to get it in a second. Um, and you can download this on your computer. You have to build it on your computer. Um, and then you can uh, go and model these. You, can, you would enter in the primary structure. You can go and model them. And, it's, and, I'll, and I'll show in a second. But yeah, it's great. Um, and so let's talk about, first, before we talk about that, I want to talk to you guys about some other things. So I'm going to start sharing more of my screen. So give me one second. You're going to get a big picture of me. Hey, guys, how are you doing? Um, and so we're going to talk about the terminal. And so if you've seen this before, you guys may be fam familiar with the terminal, maybe so, or maybe not. The terminal is pretty much like a text software, so not too different than your Word, but allows you to access all your files and everything on your computer. And so you're gonna have my stuff in the, the background, um, but we're gonna kind of focus on this and I can make it a little bigger maybe. So yeah. Um, and so yeah, you can access files. So let me show you some things you can do. So if I CD, this is going out of a file. So let me just show you one second. So if I do LS, right, you can see all the things I have here. LS allows you to look at the files in your system, right? And I can go, oh, users, right? Because I want to get to my stuff. Let's say there's multiple people on the server or something like that. That's why it'd be important. Um, not cores, please. Oh, users, sorry. <laughs> I'm a step ahead. So you go to users, right? And you LS and it's like, oh, there's guests shared and Colin Kalicki. I wonder who I should use. And you go, oh yeah, I'm, I'm Colin. I forgot for a second, that's weird. And you go Colin and so on and so forth. And then from there I can go to my desktop, which is where I want to end up um, later. And so that's one way, right? You can traverse in and out of files. That's very important. Um, and so this is your terminal. It's just a little tech software that helps you do things. And if you get more into, and if you stay in biology, you will have to get familiar with this. I'm sorry. Uh, I know it can suck sometimes. Um, but it, it is important. So yeah, to so use this more. And so we return, we return. Now I want to talk about compilers. So any, uh, 
we can look at this graphic for hints and things like that, but if any smart techie computer science people are in, in the chat, what is a compiler? Trans as one language. Yeah, close. Yeah, yeah. So kind of, yeah. So the way people write code, Rosetta, for example, is written in C++. Um, some other famous ones you've heard of are Python or C or Java or JavaScript or HTML, CSS, you know, there's a ton of them. They're endless. Um, and yeah, and so what it'll do is it will take that code and your computer doesn't run on that. Your computer's made up of a bunch of binary units, right? On and off switches. Um, that's why you get zero ones, one, one, zero, zero, on and off, right? Over and over again. And it's gonna take this language and turn it down into machine code or code the computer can actually digest and eat. Um, because, you know, a computer doesn't understand English and a lot of high level like C++ or Python, a lot of it's in English and things like that. And so that's what a compiler does. And so going back to Rosetta, um, Rosetta is a software that you have to probably access via your command line. You're going to access via your command line and I'll show you how. And you also need a compiler to run it. Um, there are different ways to get this. Your command line comes on your computer. It's your terminal if you use Mac. Search up CMD in your start menu if you use Windows. Um, and then you're going to have to download a separate, separate compiler to do that. Um, Xcode if you use Macs. Xcode is just in, in the App Store. You can get a compiler. Uh, you can do that now or later. Rosetta takes a really long time to build. Um, or you have to do like you'd have to download um, a thing called Clang or CCG, which are just uh, C, which is the language C. Um, or C++ compilers, so that's if you're on Windows. But that's built into Xcode, so if you're on Mac, it's a little easier, which is kind of the value of the Mac, isn't it? I run a Mac, so ha, 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 ha. Um, cool. And so what you need to do, and I'll show you where to get Rosetta in a second, um, is you need to build the software on your computer. This takes a long time. It took me about six hours, so I slept through it when I built it, when I first had to do it. Um, it's gonna take you about the same. So let me show you how to do it. So, you're gonna come over to here. Let me move some people. So you're gonna to go to Rosetta Commons. Do, 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 right there. Welcome to Rosetta. Oh, look at this. And you're gonna, oh, well, I want the software, don't you? Yeah, and you're gonna come over here and you want some license and download. So you're at this license and download place and you can follow along. It's pretty easy to follow, right? But you want the software. And you want the academic download. You'll get this like account. They'll just give it to you and you'll use it. Um, it's pretty easy and you sign in. Now they release weekly releases. Just download the most re re uh, recent one and don't worry, this is gonna start it. Um, and you, I downloaded the one with one bundle. This will take maybe 30 minutes to an hour to download completely. Um, but yeah, that's not the long part. <laughs> Actually building it is the long part. And so you're gonna download it. Of course, it's a huge file. It's gonna come in a zip folder. So even a smaller file, a zip folder just compresses all the code. It's like a you take a really nice picture, but you want to download it on your phone. It has to compress because your phone doesn't have that much data for pictures. Um, things like that. Uh, so it's compress it. You have to open it. You guys know how to open zip files. I, I believe in y'all. Um, and so once you open that, then it'll download completely. And then you're going to run to your, go to your terminal and wherever you want. And let me, ooh, it's in, we'll have it in the background too. I planned for this. You're going to run this command here, wherever you want um, it to build. And building is just making sure the software can compile on your computer and run on your computer. That's why you need the compiler. And the, so the thing you're going to type, and it's right here too on the slide, um, dot slash, which just means not dot dot slash, they won't know that, right on this computer, right where I am in my folder. So in this case, it would be desktop. So right here in desktop, uh, you're going to do scones dot py. And this is some uh, Python script uh, or Python code um, that's in the Rosetta folder somewhere mode equals release and it will access that's just a flag so it's just telling the computer where that's from and then bin and bin is short for binary so it knows like run it as a software on this computer and you're gonna run this i'm not gonna run this now i've already run it um don't worry about it <laughs> um but you, you do want to run this and build and it's like i said it's going to take a long, long time so yeah so do 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 so yeah so it's just that and now after you're done with that you've got rosette on your computer the fireworks go off. You're feeling so smart and crazy, but you're not done yet. Oh, you're not done yet. Trust me. We got more things to do. 
because now you want to predict how a protein will fold. You're a scientist. You're all the way up here. You're like, wow, I've got my primary structure and I've changed leucine. Uh, I've changed all the leucines out for cytosine. You know, that's a big, cytosine is one of those weird ones. It's got a sulfur in it. How is that going to change the, how's that going to change the structure? You want to predict that. Um, and this is thing you, you're going to do all the time. And so let's find out how we do that. So you can go to Unipro or PDB. Um, PDB is protein data bank. They also make the piles for them. Unipro, you can also get it. Unipro is also another protein data bank. So it's just got all the proteins here. Um, I'm going to use PDB because it's easy. So PDB. Oh, look at this. Oh, so cool. And so don't get confused here. So the protein will do because it's a really easy easy tutorial protein is one ELW. And it's a bit of a pun too, because it's a chaperone. So I guess I'll quiz you on that. Molecule of the month. Is there a molecule of the month? Oh, I didn't see that. Glycoprotein. Uh, don't trust myelin. Myelin, <laughs> they're jerks. Um, <laughs> I don't mess with myelins. Um, I only mess with one ELWs. So what's a chaperone? Uh, for the pun, what's a chaperone? Does anyone know? Yeah, exactly. They help with protein folding. Yeah, they are the moms of the group. They make sure everyone's in order. God damn it. Um, and so, yeah, so they got it from E. coli, or that's the expression systems, E. coli. It's from homeostasis. Um, so <laughs> there's truly. Um, and so there's more information here. If we, we can go on Uniprot too, and I can show you more too. Uniprot is great, and I'll show you what Uniprot looks like if it loads. Sorry, my, like I said, my internet's like super weird right now. And yeah, so stress induced, cool, right? And so Uniprot has a ton of information about it, more than you'll need, but you can also find a, a FASTA file, or not, sorry, not the FASTA file. You don't want that yet. Um, you could get the FASTA file, but you can also find the PDB file here. But for PDB files, which is what you can pull up in PyMol and it has the 3D structure in it, go to PDB or rcsb.org, or just look at PDB, which is Protein Data Bank. For more information or other things like the sequence, you can go to Uniprot. They're the same thing, pretty much, but PDB is just a little easier. Good. Um, cool. And so we'll continue. So that's one file. So let's say I downloaded it, and uh, I already have downloaded it. So let me minimize and then go here. Do, 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 do. <laughs> I'm poor, so this is free. Wait, no, it's the no license trial. Oh, that's okay. We just got to do this. I'll show you how to fix that. Do, 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 do. So if you guys want to learn how to, um, oh, yeah, so you just skipped activation and you reload it, and then you don't have to worry about a license ever. Isn't that nice? That's how you be a cheapskate. Um, and if you, a great tutorial to watch, and I recommend it is our, ours truly, Alan's PyMole tutorial. I'm not gonna go over it, um, but yeah, there's great things here. So yeah, I wanna show this as a cartoon, if that would work, or all as a cartoon. Do, do, I don't know, whatever, it's fine. Um, you can see the structure here. Uh, the cartoon would just remove all these red dots. Um, and so this is the structure we want. And the one we're gonna focus on is just one of them, just one of these, um, and it'd be great. It'd be great. Alrighty, so let me return to my Google Slides here. So great, so now we collected one of our files. Um, now we get our FASTA file. And if you've been watching the web webinars recently or some of the other stuff we've been doing, you've been hearing this file name all over the, the place, it's crazy. What a FASTA file is, is a file for, you know, mostly bioinformatics softwares where you're gonna usually have like a primary sequence in there for protein and also some information about the protein or maybe a nucleotide sequence maybe. So just some struct like sequence and some information on the top. And it's a text file, so not too separate, different than like a Word doc. Um, and you'll upload it to software and this example, Rosetta Commons, or maybe Snapchain or maybe Benchling and I'll know how to read it and I'll know that it's maybe a primary structure or these are some changes you wanna to do to it based on what's in the file. Um, you can get the FASTA file from a lot of places. Like I said, you can get it from Uniprod. Um, you can probably get it from RSP. You can also get it from here. If you already have it pulled up in Pomo, you can save. And you do like, uh, I already had it saved, so I'm not gonna do it again, FASTA. Um, and then what do you want saved? One ELW. And then where do you want it saved? And you can say like uh, users, conflicty, slash desktop. 
If you do that, then you'll get it here. If you can see it over here on my screen. You guys can see my screen, right? Cool, yeah. Yeah, so you'll get it over here. And uh, if, I, if I pull it up, I have it automatically pull up into Snapchain, which is where I use it mostly. Um, no, I don't want to buy Snapchain. Um, and you can see, like, you can see, here's my sequence. And so pull it up automatically from that file. And I can do some things with it. Maybe I can edit it and out, uh, get out of here. Um, and it's great, right? So that's your FASTA file. But we're not done yet. So but we got that FASTA. Now we need one more thing, Robeda. Robeda. So let me ask you about this. What do you imagine, if you were here for the last lecture when I did this, you can't answer because I already gave this answer out. So I won't allow it. It's, uh, but let's imagine you're a computer and you're looking at this protein. Um, how do you think you'd go about trying to bend it? How do you think you'd go about predicting how to fold it? Any guesses? What are some things you might look for? What are some qualities? You can even get some qualities and things like that. I know you guys talked about it a little earlier, like amino acid characteristics. Um, maybe what are some shortcuts you would take? Let's say you're a smart, you're a smart cookie, you're a smart little computer. And uh, Steve Wozniak's been working on you day and night and he's, affected you. Do you have any idea of what maybe shortcuts you can take? Identify the R groups. Yeah, yeah, that actually is like kind of important to it. Yeah. Um, any other ideas? Thank you so much for answering. It's pretty correct. And that's okay. So I'll show you Robetta first and then uh, we'll answer it. I thought I had it pulled up, but maybe I closed out of it. That's okay. Robetta.org. And you're going to pull up to this thing. So Robetta's ran out of a lab. Uh, I think a, a Baker lab. I think it's at Berkeley. Boo! But no, it's a great, it's a great thing. And so what you're going to do is you're going to come here um, and you want to submit something. Oh, look at this. Um, and so you can do target name, one ELWA, you can do protein sequence, and I could go to my snap gene to loads, maybe it'll load. Or not, I could just choose my file and upload it too. There's a couple ways of doing that, right? Um, and so I could put enter in my sequence, copy and paste it. Let's say it's like like that, right? It'll know what you're doing. Uh, I've already done this before, so I'm just showing you the ropes. You go down here, you can, uh, don't really worry about these. Um, you want constraints? No, no, you're good. And then you answer this like quick question here, it's five, and then you can submit. And it's gonna take some time. Um, as you can see here, they're kind of backed up, but you can see job student stuff like that. Whenever I submit for it, um, it takes about, I don't know, four days, something like that. Uh, they're a bit more backed up now than they used to be, just because that's the way the world is. And so what you're going to get are these files here. Boom. Boom. You get more than these, but these are the three files you want. Um, sorry, I'm just organizing. Oh, this is for later. <laughs> um, so yeah, so what these are, are these are fragment files. And you're like, what the hell does that mean? A fragment file, as... Um, Caitlin put it, kind of identifies the R groups. So let's see, and I really want to pull this up. Please, please pull up. All right, let me open up the FASTA again. Cool, I don't know why it didn't work that way. All right, cool. And so you can copy and paste this, right? So let's say we looked in here and we're like, um, all right, these, so it'll go by. So you have three fragment and nine fragment. And it sounds like, 
It kind of does. It splits the sequence into fragments of threes. Um, one of the files does. And it'll look down here. So UQV. Um, again, these are just uh, residue um, shortenings. So uh, E is glutamic acid. Uh, yeah, V is valine, Q is glutamine, things like that. Um, and these are defined by their R groups, obviously. Um, and so you go down these three and be like, huh, those three, hmm, nothing special about them. These three, oh, these three. I know these three always form a, a pleated sheet. They just 99% of the time, they form a pleated sheet. These next three, oh, they don't do much. Oh, these next three. Oh, these, 85% of the time, they're gonna form an alpha helix. That's just what you find in nature. It's just kind of how it is. And so it's almost like a shortcut, right? It's like you have a ledger, and you can look at the ledger and be like, oh, you don't have to guess the phone number from blank. Maybe you get the area code, right? And this can cut time of how long these structures take to build drastically. It's a little shortcut, right? Um, and so that's what the three fragment, the three mer file does. Um, you also want the nine mer file, which just means fragments of nine. So split this up in nine and look at that um, and look at data has. If you open up those files, you will have no idea how to read them. There's really long files um, all the way. You can put like three, the three of these proteins together and all their angles and things like that. So let me get more specific about how Rosetta Commons kind of holds things. So what Rosetta Commons will do is chemicals aren't solid, right? If I go over to them, they're not like a, let's imagine I'm a little tiny miniature atomic sized human being. And I go over to a molecule and I try to bend it. Sure, it's gonna be hard, but it's not gonna be like a steel beam. They're flexible, right? They form bonds, they bend a little bit. And so that's what Rosetta, don't, not confused with Robeda, Rosetta Commons will do. Uh, the software will go kind of, um, that file helps, those files will help shorter, but if, if you didn't have those files, it'd go one by one, testing all angles that each amino acid could bend at. Um, which you can see, let's say I'm not trying to predict one ELW, which is 117 amino acid, but I'm trying to predict one, which is not unreasonably 500 to 1,000 uh, amino acids or residues. You can see that gets kind of crazy. That gets ludicrous in your computer or a foreign server won't run that very quickly. And so you need these kind of shortcut files. You need the three more, you need the nine more fragments in order to make this run. Um, and so that's another file you need. So right now, uh, if it's clear, we're kind of collecting files in order to make this thing run. And then there's also one last file um, you're going to want. And let me pull it up over here. Um, it says SS2 file. Um, this file is pretty Cool. I mean, it helps with like the, the final folding with like hydrophobic interactions and the hydrophobic effect. It's gonna make that final tertiary structure and it's shortcuts for that. So it's really cool. And so now let's do a little underview because that was a ton of information, a lot of computer science talk, a lot of files talk, and it's not that cool. And I know that, um, but it's important. There's also one other thing. Uh, where's my PDB file? Where are you? There we are. Cool. So we have the PDB file. Why do, and I'm gonna also do this to make sure I talked, I told everything that you guys need to know. Why do we need the PDB file? And again, we got this from uh, Protein Data Bank. Um, the PD, PDB file gives you kind of a template. Um, it is this pro, folded protein as it comes as we know it, right? Maybe we tested this in the lab with x-ray crystallography. We know what this protein looks like with 99% certainty. We're on top of it. Um, that's what the PDB file should be if you're getting it from PDB or Unipod, maybe. Um, and now why do you want that? Well, you're never going to really, um, like I said, this is an area where maybe you guys can be the revolutionaries of uh, biocomputation. Um, it's extremely difficult to make a protein from scratch. It would even have a computer make a protein from scratch. Um, and you guys can imagine why, you know, all your different amino acids, all the different ways they can bend, all the different ways they can interact um, to make one effective to say the least, right? Um, because if you're wrong about maybe a couple residues, the protein will denature. Um, if you're eating the disease, but one disease is one amino acid change and, you're, and if you, if the complete protein denature kills a human at 22. Things like that, it's crazy. Um, and so what you do is you have a file to base it off of. This is another kind of shortcut, right? It's like, well, the file, sh the protein should kind of look like this. We know it could kind of look like this. Um, then you have your FASTA file. This allows you to feed in your new protein. So let's say I actually wanted to try to engineer a new protein based off of the chaperone. So I want a different chaperone that wants to interact with maybe um, different specific proteins. Um, I would engineer it and then submit a FASTA file. And then I would go over 
and you could get that FASTA file, you can model in PyMol a little bit maybe, and then get the FASTA file from PyMol, or just get the FASTA file from really anywhere. There's a, a lot of software that does that. And then you go over to Robeda, and you enter in that FASTA file, or the, the primary sequence of your protein, and you'll get a bunch of files, but you want these three files. And they'll say three mer fragment, nine mer fragment, um, and then just look for the SS2, that's how I find them. Um, and these will again give you your shortcuts to actually fold these proteins. You know, we know which way these proteins are gonna fold, or if these three are grouped together, these nine are grouped together, we know their secondary structure with a oh, uh, high certainty. I just knocked over my head. Oops. And that's pretty good, right? Um, and now we kind of have all the files we really need. But there's one file that's gonna make your life extremely easy. And so I'm gonna show you why you're gonna want it. Um, first, any questions about any of that? Because that's kind of the meat and potatoes of what I'm talking here. This is, I'm, I'm cooking a protein stew, and we're now getting to the best part. We scrape the bottom of the bowl where it all sank to. Do you guys like stew or metaphors? I don't really know. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> all right. If no questions, I'll continue. <laughs> all right. So this is called a flags file. Now, let me go over to my termi terminal. If you guys have ever used GitHub before, GitHub is a uh, repository owned by our corporate overlords at Microsoft. Um, and it, what it is is like... Uh, just you can push your code to it, and it's a nice thing that stores code because you can't store code on your computer, and other people, a bunch of people can work at code at once. And so if you ever do GitHub, you're going to git commit. This is my, like, a very example you do all the time. So git commit, so I'm committing, I'm pushing my code and committing it to it. It's not scared of marriage. It's fine. Uh, don't worry. Um, and it's like, we are cool. That's right. And so this dash N here, that's a flag. Um, and in computer science, flags will specify certain things about your command. So git will like specify like I'm, I'm going to GitHub. I'm running the command commit, but I want to add something. And this flag is that add and that dash something will do it. And for commit, their language is this, right? They just have a dash M. And what that means is add a comment. So my comment is we are, we are cool. If I did that right now, it'd have no clue what I'm talking about because I'm not in something that can push to git. Usually I'll have a file with all the git. Uh, uh, <laughs> I don't know, get code in it. Yeah, I'll just say code, get code in it. Um, and you'd run it. So that's a really common example. I hope that made sense, but it will make sense a little bit more in a second. I'm pulling out my flags file. So your flags file is just this text file here. And you're like, whoa, what is all these words and things like that, Colin? Don't worry about it. We'll talk about it. So you got a database. Um, this will make also like your protein structure. So I'll show you, right? Uh, I can show you my files too. So let me go to my files. Let me, it's in my downloads. So Rosetta, cool. Cool, it's gonna pull up a bunch of this. Awesome, can I get my Rosetta folder, please? All right, we're gonna search through my files with me, have fun. Uh, it's a lot of homework and not fun things. Combined PDF, if you ever use that website, it's great. Let me see, do you like Ah, oh, here we are, so great, my Rosetta folder. And so you can go into main here, and in main, you can find a database, right? And so this is what I'm loading. For my database, I'm saying, hey, flag database, load this database. And this database will have a bunch of information about how proteins have folded in the past. This again, will make it shorter and things like that, which is really great. Um, cool. Now, there's another flag here, flag in file FASTA. Um, the in file FASTA, will you just load your FASTA flag? And again, what does this dash slash command mean? The dash slash command means hey, find it in this, uh, this file or this section. So it's on my desktop, it's in my desktop file, or if it's in my downloads, it's in my downloads file. Um, this is a bug that you may run into and I'll show you, I'll do a live demonstration of a mess up that I actually did and I figured out recently. Uh, your frag three file, um, your frag nine file, these are what we talked about just a second ago. And you can find them here, dash slash and it's this file, dot slash it's this file. Um, now you want the native file. The native file is the file that you're comparing it to. It's your PDB file, right? The one we already know what it looks like. Then you're gonna get some other things. Ab initio relax. This has to do with the algorithm that ab initio. Ab initio is the software we're running on. Um, give me one second. Sorry. Uh... Sorry. My mother was asking me something. So yeah, ab initio relax. And, and so uh, that's just something you're gonna wanna play because you don't have it in, it's gonna break because it doesn't know kind of what algorithm it can run. And struct, 
that's the number of structures, hence and struct. Right now, we're gonna run this on our computer. We're only gonna run one. And that's gonna take, it would take, if I hadn't already done it, it would take like five to 15 minutes to run, depending on how complicated the structure. But if you're in real life and you wanna do this, you're a scientist, I know you're all a scientist, that's not enough structures. So you're gonna want like 2,500, maybe even 25,000, maybe even 30,000, because you want good data. But we're not gonna do that right now because that would take forever to run on my computer. So we're not gonna worry about it. Um, but if you did do this, you're also, if you increase your structures, you're gonna treat, uh, change the output file. Um, and I'll probably do a lesson on that maybe in two weeks when I show you guys how to do more with Rosetta because this is a endless treasure trove of cool information and doing cool things with proteins. So the out is, as it sounds, the out file, what is it gonna push out? It's gonna push out a PDB and I've already done it over here. Look at this little guy, he's so cute. And that's just kind of what they named it. Um, and so it comes out as a PDB. You can, you're, if you run it actually, you're not gonna wanna out it as a, a PDB because you get 25,000 PDB files. <laughs> and you don't want 25,000 PDB files because most of them are useless. So you'd out it to some uh, silent file and the silent file would just collect all the files. Again, I'll show you that in maybe a separate lecture. We do it together. But this is just kind of getting familiar with Rosette. Now you want your psiprid slash ss2 out file that's good there. And then everything else here, um, I pretty much leave. This is how it comes default. You find your flags. Um, you can make this flags thing, um, but you can just copy in this. And so when we upload this, um, upload this to YouTube and things like that, if you guys want to just copy down and look at this. Um, but this is also pretty easily found on the Rosetta website. Um, these all just specify certain things about the algorithm. And it's pretty great. Um, and it helped the algorithm run and tells it how to run. So that's how it works. Now you're like, cool, Colin, like flags, whatever get to the actual running of it. And I'm like, all right, I'll get you there. So let me clear up this so it doesn't look so messy. I don't want my mail, excuse me. Um, I want that, cool. And so we're gonna pull up our terminal one last time and here's what we're gonna run. So what this is pretty much saying is, okay, locate my ab initio, which is the software in Rosetta that does the protein folding. Uh, locate that um, code and also locate um, kind of like how to, that code and how to run it and what software to run it on is pretty much what this is saying. And so we're gonna run uh, default on, it's gonna say Max, cause Mac, because we're not running a Linux, um, Max machine. And this is pretty much say compile for a Mac. Um, and that makes sure we can run it on our, our machine here. And so let me write this out for you. So users, right? And then from users, I'm gonna go my name. And then from my name, I'm gonna go to uh, downloads. That's where it is. And then Rosetta, and I'm just tabbing. If, uh, because tabbing will like automatically complete it. And so now you're gonna go main, because that's the only file as I showed you earlier. Uh, I show you what this is doing actually, kind of literally. Um, so you're in main, remember you're in main, main, source, and then uh, bin, and then you get this here. And this is what we're gonna run. So that's what this, is, this line is doing. Um, but it's just better to do it here because you can't, this will run it on your computer actually. Um, and you'll know how to run it once we add the flags. Uh, main, source, spell it right, um, bin. Um, and then you do, after that you do um, app dot default, because we just want to run the default with max, things like that. Um, and then we do our app flags file. Um, if you ran this, it'd run, and it's great. It would run and run and run and you, this is gonna take a little shorter or maybe it won't, I don't know. Um, yeah, it's done already. It's not gonna take that short if you run this for the first time, but I've already run this before. So it, like, it's like, why are you running this code again, weirdo? And what it's gonna load is this new uh, predicted protein structure. And that's pretty cool. Look at that, we predicted the fold of a random thing we just put in um, and we opened it up and look at it. And then we could do some things with PyBall and compare them together. And it would be really, uh, you can get a lot of information about it. And now you've predicted your first protein structure. And hey, that doesn't look half bad. That does not look half bad. It's only, it's only one of the, the motifs. Um, but yeah, it looks pretty good. And we could do more like real comparisons to it and statistical comparisons, but maybe for a different time. Um, and now we've run that. So something to be very careful about. So let's say, um, let's say I see uh, CD out or something like that. And then I ran this again. Oh, you're gonna break it. 
And so this is, this is the error I caught in my last lecture. And I was like, what? how'd I do that? And it's, it's a pretty easy fix. Um, make sure your files are where you think they are. Uh, make sure if you're doing this, right? If I ran this code again, I don't know how far I am out. Let's see how far I am out. All right, cool. Yeah, if I ran this code again, uh, I'd want to do like something like this. And then uh, upon clicky, then I'd run a run, uh, desktop. No, something like that would work. Trust me. An easier way is just go to where your uh, uh, files are. Or, oh, wait, I was in users, so I'd have to do a, something else. I'd have to add a thing. Um, go to where your flag file is. My flag file is on my desktop. I showed you where it is. Um, run this code and it'll run. Let's say we also ran that code uh, when I was out of it, then you need to change all of these flags too. And you need to change all these flags because these flags are looking where my like, flags file is. So I told it to look on my desktop. That's what I told my terminal to do here. I said, look at my desktop for my flags file. That's where I am right now. So it looks at my desktop and then it would be like, desktop, is this here? Is this here? Is this here? Is this here? So you just gotta be careful. And you're pretty much ready. Um, I recommend um, kind of going through and building Rosetta on your computer, maybe even trying this. This is like the basic tutorial one. This is the one, the folding of one ELW is, you know, pretty small, things like that. This is the basic structure they're going to um, teach you how to do and fold. And so try this on your own, um, get it working. Um, like I said, building the thing is the longest part of it. Maybe getting the files. You can find those files free online though. Um, so you don't need to use Rebeta, but that's what you're going to use in the future. If you ever do this, you're going to use Rebeta to get your three more, nine more, and then tertiary folding files. Um, you can also find it. Um, you can find uh, the files elsewhere because they're so common um, if you don't want to wait. So I recommend you guys go through this and do it because probably my next in lecture in two weeks um, or a webinar, we're going to continue on Rosetta and we're going to do a lot cooler things with Rosetta. Um, not just this simple protein folding, but maybe protein interactions. Um, or lag in competition. There's a lot of cool things you can simulate with this. So yeah, so that's pretty much it. Um, I want to pull them up one more time just so we can be proud of what we did here today. And show how <laughs> stingy I am. Oh yeah, look at that. Amazing, great. So do y'all have any questions? Kind of in the last, I have six minutes to kind of hang out here and stuff like that. So I have one question. So can you combine multiple predicted folded proteins in Pymol, like to see how they would interact? Yeah, yeah you can do that. Okay. It's pretty easy. Yeah, you can, um, what you're just going to do is like open it up in Pymol pretty much. Like you can run the open, uh, whatever your structure PDB file is. Uh, you see that command line on top of Pymol? You can just run open one uh, elw.pdb and it'll open up right there, right next to your other like predicted one. Great question, yeah, great question. And Alan's a bigger expert on uh, Pymol than I am, so hopefully I got that right. <laughs> I have a question too, Colin. Yes. Um, so far we've been talking about proteins, but as we know, proteins are, uh, they're post-translationally modified. They is, are. Is, is there a way to, to simulate those as well, to sort of model those? Yeah, there is, probably. I mean, I'm pretty sure there is. Uh, this one will probably just model it based off, like I said, the sequence structure. So this is kind of, this is what's known as de novo protein structure synthesis, kind of, which means just it's taking these amino acids as they are in a vacuum and trying to predict the structure. Um, a lot of the like post-translational modifications come with interactions with other mo proteins and molecules and stuff like that. And you can definitely simulate those in Rosetta. So you can simulate a protein with a chaperone. So maybe you're simulating one ELW with something else. So maybe we'll do that uh, on a later one. A great question. Oh, no worries. Thank you so much for joining. No, they're gone. I was talking to myself. Great. Uh, any other questions? Thank you all for showing up. This went better than the last one, right, Al? Yeah, uh, thank you all for showing up. Yeah. It's great having you guys. Um, so thank you, Colin, for that great presentation. <laughs> if you guys want to uh, join us next week, I'll be telling you guys how to be a DNA ninja. So. <laughs> Wait, what we'll, be, we'll be talking about some biotech stuff. We'll be talking about uh, 
how to use DNA to our advantage and how we actually manipulate DNA inside of a in vitro environment. So yeah, it's, it is, it's hype. All right, I'll stop recording.